I've touched a variety of different Unix operating systems, and I even made a video stating how I've gone down the Linux rabbit hole, and now the Unix rabbit hole is next. And I decided, you know what, I'll make a tier list of what all I've used so far. And so, here I am. So, this is going to be a traditional tier list. So I rank them all S through F on what all my opinion at least is. So let me make sure everything is all good here. And yeah, it appears everything is fine. All right, so first off, Ubuntu. Now, my first introduction into Unix with, well, my first introduction into Linux was with Ubuntu. I never touched a Unix operating system in my life other than Android. But I'm talking about the desktop here, of course. Desktop and the server, not touching mobile. Ubuntu, well, I had to leave it due to some instabilities with Snap. Ubuntu, for the most part, is a pretty solid desktop operating system, but they have an extreme dependency on their proprietary Snap packages. So if that was not there, or they instead do something more, uh, well, more robust like Flatpaks, then this would not be an issue. So I'm going to put that in, of course, the B category. In fact, you know what? I'm going to put it in the C category due to the fact that Thanks to Snaps, it uh, has a few instabilities, and if it has no stability, and it's meant to be stable, then it's not really worth it. Next up, we have Linux Mint. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just put this into S tier and tell you why. So, Linux Mint, I'm talking about the uh, Ubuntu-based one, as well as LMD, but it's basically what Ubuntu should have been. It is not dependent on some sort of proprietary package manager of any kind. It is not uh, restricting the user from having their modular Unix operating system. And because of that, I put it in the S tier. Not only because of that, but because it is much more favorable to the majority of people for a very specific reason. That reason being that it is familiar, it is very stable, very robust, and there's generally never been an actual problem with the Linux Mint operating system. And so I put it in the S tier. Now, another one that's Ubuntu based is the Pop! OS from System76. Now, System76, they have made great strides in keeping this operating system as robust as possible. After all, they are shipping it on their own OEM devices, so they cannot afford to have something that ships out unstable. Now, I do have a few um, problems with it, that which being that it is somewhat bloated in its design of its desktop environment, but I'm not really going to hold that against them. However, they've had some slight problems with instabilities in the past, and that was shown in, Linus Tech Tip, in the Linus Tech Tip video, uh, the first one of going into Linux. And so with that one, I'll put them in the A tier. I would put them in S, but slight problem. Now, I'm going to go into the Red Hat world now. First off, with Red Hat. I'm going to put that in the S tier. Now, this is traditionally a more corporate operating system. And it is actually quite fine. So it is very robust. It has a great method of package management. And while it is, of course, a paid operating system, I'm not going to hold that against it. It is a corporate operating system and for business use, production use, general professional work. And because of that, I put it in the S tier. I have touched RHEL a little bit uh, through some ulterior means. And, well, I haven't had an issue with it. It is, it's, it's also a system that I've never heard of anybody else having a problem with. 
And since we're in the Red Hat world, let's talk about Sousa. Now, I made a video about Sousa, and I was very critical of it. However, after having some time in the general Unix world, I've come to understand its actual purpose. I've also come to understand that I wasn't really fair to it, and I'm going to make another video on it at some point, where I'll be much more fair to the SUSE operating system. SUSE is perfectly stable. I criticized it for not having a file manager, but I was using the, if I it was the ICE window manager. It was its generic desktop environment that you build off of. That is something that I completely understand. I give it S tier because honestly, it is perfectly fine. Now let's go ahead and go into Fedora. Now Fedora, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with Fedora. On one hand, it ships itself as being super robust, super friendly, and it is just that. However, I have to begin to question its actual uh, stability. For some weird reason, there seems to be a problem with instability. I'm not fully certain of what it is, but a lot of people have started to notice this. And I would be putting it in the A tier, or even the S tier, if this was not a question. But, unfortunately, it is. Now, I've gone over those pretty quickly. I've done six operating systems in only six minutes. Let's go ahead and go into the Unix world some. First off is Irix from SGI, Silicon Graphics Incorporated. This operating system, nowadays it's really unusable. However, back in its glory days, it was one of the best. It was back in the days of the Unix Wars. It was back in the days of bringing 3D acceleration to a reality. And it was absolutely amazing at doing that. It is by far one of the most robust, one of the most usable and sustainable operating systems I've ever touched. And unfortunately, the dot-com crash killed Silicon Graphics. And that is highly unfortunate. So I put it in S tier because of what it was. It is currently non-existent. But in its day, it was, well... Yeah, sure it was proprietary, but it was the best. And you really, really can't say it wasn't, unless you want to give something else that crown, such as Solaris. Now, Solaris, I give this an A. Solaris from Sun Microsystems and is now currently owned by the Oracle Corporation. I put it in A because, well, if some x still owned it, I'm certain it would still be in the S category. But for some reason, Oracle is insistent on trying to kill it off. I guess it's some sort of market dominance strategy. Perhaps they want to bring Oracle Linux into the mix. And I've touched that, but I'm not going to put it in here because it goes about the same as SUSE or Red Hat. Because it's Red Hat based anyway. It... It seems as if there's something being planned out by Oracle. I'm not certain of what it is. And while they have given it a very long time of support, and they plan to support it for much, much longer, it is becoming apparent that its days are heavily numbered. It's supposed to have support ended in 2035, if I'm not wrong. But for Workstation OS, if they're not going to release a new one, well... Obviously, that's a problem. They have no plans to actually keep it up. They have no plans to get really new programs for it. No plans to work and strategize with other companies. And because of that, I unfortunately must put it in the A tier. Now, Open Indiana. I also put in the A tier. Oracle killed off Open Solaris. And... That's a little cold one. I'll grab another one. They killed off Open Solaris, and that is very unfortunate, seeing as how 
Open Solaris built the backbone of a lot of different servers. Open Indiana built off of Lumos. A Lumos meant to continue the ride of Open Solaris. At least the kernel. Open Indiana is a much more Solaris feel. It gives a much more Solaris feel. It is deployable immediately. It is an easy to get into without any actual hassle. And because of that, its support, at least in the world of, of the programs, in the actual point of it, the workstation world, I had to put it in A. But both of these, it's not a bad thing. It's just the unfortunate decision of the time. Now I ran a very, very specific operating system for a little while called Arch Linux. Now Arch Linux, on one hand, they, well, they have their point. It's not really a bare bones distro. And I used to call it a bare bones distro myself, but honestly, I dabbled into other ones I'll get into later. No, Arch is, it is not bare bones. If you call it bare bones, you're lying to yourself. Yes, it doesn't really give you a lot of the packages. It is somewhat deep. It's very lacking in bloat, except for the system D in its system, but, well, even Linux Mint has that. But I'm not going to call it absolutely horrible. However, there's a big however to this. The problem with Arch Linux is that, yes, it is rolling release. There are new packages all the time. You'll probably spend more time updating than you will actually using the system, but packages are kept up to date. However, that has brought a lot of instability. And while the AUR and Yay and everything somewhat remedies half of that, Pac-Man itself while it is a great package manager, and honestly, it's probably the best for a community operating system that I've ever seen. While it is amazing, I cannot necessarily say it is stable. It is not stable. And I've even gone to forums, and there appears to be a sort of disconnect from reality. And looking back on myself back in the Arch Linux days, there was a disconnection from reality. The belief that Arch, exactly, is not stable, it is reliable. Well, those tie into each other. It can be stable, but not reliable, but for it to be reliable, it would have to be stable. And because of that, I put it in B. There are much better operating systems to use if you care about stability. And I will even show those later on. Now, there's another specific operating system that I've been dabbling into in virtual machines that's tied into a lot of the modern Unix workstation, and that is Next Step. So, a little bit of backstory. 1984, Apple releases Macintosh, and you will see why 1984 won't be like 1984. That was a failure. 1985, Steve Jobs is fired from Apple. 1986, he founds a company called Next Computers. The E, originally supposed to be NXT, but the E as in education. Now, while on one hand, the company fell due to the fact that it really was not cheap. Yes, it was meant to go into higher education, but... It was also targeted a little bit at developers later on in his life. But the developer market had a problem. Why the hell we pay $50,000 for the full software suite? This was at the height of their day in 1996. That was right before they got acquired by Apple. Built with the mock kernel using BSD utilities. I've been playing around with it in a virtual machine trying to make a Neo fetch for it. I put it in the, well, I can't put it on the same tier as Arch Linux. I put it in A. 
Nowadays, unusable, but is a great foundation. A little bit of backstory, though. It also is what Tim Berners-Lee used for the first server of the World Wide Web. Now, it is also the backbone of the Darwin kernel used in Apple's Mac OS. And I'm also going to go ahead and rate that here as well. I hate to do this, but I'll have to put it on the same tier as, unfortunately, as Arch Linux. That of which being the B tier. And that is only because of its proprietary nature. And yes, Next Step was proprietary, but Open Step was around giving a lot of open utilities, such as the GNU C compiler as well as Bash. Now the Mac OS, it's, well, I used to hate it, all right? I used to absolutely hate it, but I touched it a little bit recently, used it, while it is proprietary, and I would absolutely choose some of the BSDs or a Linux distro over the Mac OS. If I had to pick between Windows and the Mac OS, I'm going to go ahead and suck off Tim Cook all damn day for that. Because it's actually stable. The Mac OS is stable. Now there are a lot of things I do not like about the Mac OS though. That of which being that it is one, proprietary, but for this case I'm willing to let it slide. It is hardware dependent nowadays. Thank you Tim Cook. Also, it unfortunately does not have window tiling. Even Windows is on that. Nowadays, it still uses the mock kernel, but with FreeBSD utilities. Now, what about FreeBSD? It is by far one of the best Unix systems I've ever touched. I have to put it in S. It is stable, and while it can be somewhat difficult to get into, it has a learning curve. Once you learn it, it's not hard. It's really not hard. Yes, you do have to learn it. But it is a, it has a very friendly community. It has what is honestly the best documentation I've ever seen. Um, Arch Linux should definitely learn a lesson from FreeBSD. And because of all of that, I give it this rating of S. It is absolutely amazing. Now what about OpenBSD? Well, FreeBSD can be used for just about anything, and so can OpenBSD, because Unix is modular. I do have to say this. OpenBSD. It's made really, really clear it is not a desktop OS. Do not try to use it as a desktop OS. It is a server and embedded system operating system. That is the point. And there's a reason why the developers of OpenBSD will tell you to go fuck yourself if you ask for Wi-Fi drivers. That of which being because it is for servers and embedded systems. Embedded systems at the most. Preferably for the server. It is a perfectly fine operating system. It is just as good as FreeBSD, but it by all means has its purpose. FreeBSD can be used as a workstation, as a home computer even, for basic PC tasks. It's fine for the server, for the mainframe, for everything really. Just as good as most Linux distros. OpenBSD has its use case, and if you can't respect its use case, trust me, you're not going to have a good time. Now, FreeBSD has a learning curve. What necessarily doesn't? GhostBSD. GhostBSD, built off FreeBSD, ironically it's under it right now, perfectly solid OS, except for the fact that on FreeBSD, you install a Wi-Fi, you install a Wi-Fi driver, you won't actually, probably won't need to, you want sound, you want non-tearing visuals, you're good. GhostBSD, have fun. Now, it's still solid, and if you're willing to just mute or willing to fix it all, it's fine, but it tries to bring in this sort of ease of use feel, and it doesn't really do that. 
Now, maybe my ISO is just weird, or maybe there's currently a problem with uh, GhostBSD. But, GhostBSD, while it is stable, while it's almost perfect, it has a few problems with peripherals, audio for the most part, and I've seen some Wi-Fi problems, but that wasn't for me. Mostly just audio problems. Now, I'm not an audiophile, but if I'm telling you to use my headset and you're not using my headset, or if I tell you to lower the volume and you're not lowering the volume, you're just muting at the very end, I wouldn't necessarily call that ease of use. Now, I know I probably should not be adding this next one, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. AT&T System 5 Unix. I've been playing around with it a little bit in a virtual machine. And it has aged, definitely. Obviously, it's no longer supported. It's an OS from a very, very long time ago, from decades. But I had to put it in B. Now, the reason why it's not getting A or S is because it doesn't have basic utilities like top, for example. And while you can install all of these, and it has a lot of packages to get Xenix applications from Microsoft Xenix, and I never touched that, and I might do a video on it, as well as BSD and others, it doesn't come with the normal utilities that a Unix OS should have out of the box, even from the much earlier days of Unix. So it's, it's very stable, though. You can, add, you can add in and out all you really want. But it has a few small problems, which would have been really difficult to remedy back in those days. Gen 2. Gen 2, well, I actually have not touched Gen 2. But I am not here to critique it negatively. I'm actually here to critique it positively. Gen 2 has its user base. Gen 2 does not have a use case. The use case is decided by you. And the same thing also goes for Linux from scratch. Linux from scratch and Gen 2 do not have a use case. The user must decide that on their own. You build it for how you want it. That's really all there is to it. Now what about Debian? And you can see I'm running out of space here on S, but that's not really going to matter because nothing else here is going to be going into S tier. Debian, while it really does have some old packages, the point was and is its stability is the purpose of having such outdated packages. That is the general consens consensus that they're trying to get around. Debian is stable, obviously. It is perfectly usable. It is... Unfortunately, they've went ahead and introduced System D to it instead of keeping old System 5 or going to S6 or going to OpenRC. But unfortunately, I do understand the purpose and it is somewhat depressing. Now, let's go ahead and talk about some slightly less favorable distros. Garuda, I give a C tier. Now, Garuda is not an absolutely horrible OS, but it is eye candy. By all means, it is eye candy. The point of it is not... I don't really understand what its point is other than a funny, funny gamer operating system. But I don't really understand how you're supposed to play your games when all your RAM is being used by your desktop environment. Alright, I'm just going to say that right now. It's eye candy. It doesn't have a real use case. Let's just step over this one for now. This part was going to come. Manjaro, right in the F tier, blending in with the green. Now, Manjaro, an Arch-based distro, same thing with Garuda. It, um, 
uh, it's it's a mess, and even I fell for it. Even I fell for the mess that is Manjaro Linux. Now, on the surface, it's a perfectly fine distro. If you install it, you're generally not going to have a problem. However, from time to time, audio may go out. From time to time, uh, if you're trying to just basically get work done, it might say, ha ha, I'm going to use 6 gigabytes of RAM. And if you're trying to generally just have a stable system, have a secure system even, it might run into a problem. And at this point, you might as well just use Arch Linux. Now, don't get me wrong. When everything's going fine, Manjaro is actually S-tier, to be completely honest. But a lot of problems have happened, especially the major problem being the fact they just can't renew their SSL. Now, I don't understand what the thing is with them. I really just don't. For some reason, they feel like renewing their SSL certificate is just so hard. They use Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt is free. It's not that fucking hard to just renew your secure socket layer for your website. I don't get what the point is. I don't get why they feel like they have to tell people, roll back your clock so it looks secure, because all that you are doing is just ruining other people's systems. Pine64, they use Manjaro. Honestly, Pine64 has so much potential. Pop OS from System76. System76 is amazing. They are making great strides in bringing Linux workstations. And even bringing small mini PC hobby computers. Pine64 is a hobbyist project, alright? It's a hobbyist company. Let's face it. But they have no fucking clue how to just have something that's at least slightly usable. They're trying to get these ARM-based laptops, try to say that everything's all nice and Gucci. But first off, it's ARM. That's intellectual property. Go to Risk V. They're doing that. Time for them to finally drop Manjaro or fall off. Simple as that. Manjaro on the surface is S-tier. Manjaro, when you learn a goddamn thing about them and you stop denying... F. Honestly, I feel like I should make a tier lower. Let's talk about Slackware. Slackware I am putting in A, actually. I went ahead and messed around with it. I talked before about how it was unstable. Uh, that was a quick surface look. Because it looked a lot like Arch to me. Honestly... Slackware, same as Debian, perfectly stable, no problem at all. Alpine. Now, Alpine is quite interesting. So, on one hand, it is stable, on the other hand, it's not. And I feel like I'll need an entire video just, just to explain all of that. But... There seems to be a bit of a problem with some of the stability questions that we have. Now, just like Arch, people will try to tell you that's bare bones. It's not. It's all binary based. You're not compiling shit. I'll give this to Alpine. If you need a quick deployment, this thing will install in 10 seconds. At most. You give it a, you give it a one thread virtual machine and like 512 megabytes of memory, I'll give it 128. You will install this thing only as slow as your keystrokes. Now, it doesn't really have a lot of utilities. That's kind of the point, though. That's why I can fit into, at most, 80 megabytes of memory usage. It uses its own shell called Ash, the Alpine shell. So, that's, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. Alpine's fine. Could be better. But by all means, it could be worse. Chrome OS. 
Now I used to own a Chromebook. Actually, I still do. And for some reason, I feel kind of dirty putting Manjaro in the same place as Chrome OS. Also, D isn't being used. But at the same time, there's a little bit of reality that we got to understand. Chrome OS. Now, on the surface, it's a perfectly fine operating system. It has its use case. But, one, it is fully proprietary. Two, it has no actual sideloading. Honestly, you have... Honestly, Mac OS has a lot of freedom. Chrome OS doesn't. In fact, I have to question whether or not Chrome OS even is Linux, or if they're just saying that. They have a, they have a virtual machine to run Debian in. That virtual machine is known for being killed off really goddamn quickly. Especially when your hardware is told that it has reached end of life. Yes, forcing people to upgrade hardware, damn, it looks like Microsoft wasn't the first one to do that. Hell, Apple still supports x86, they have the Mac Pro. And you will have your Chromebook or your Chromebox be end of life whenever Google feels like it. They don't give a shit about something lasting. They don't give a shit about something being usable. Fuck Chrome OS. It's useless. It has no real use case. Honestly, if you need to give someone a super simple operating system, give them Linux Mint or give them a Mac. That's all I really have to say. So, thank you for watching this tier list. Let me know if you disagree. You, Some of you probably disagree about the Mac OS. Most likely. But let me know about your thoughts. Let me know anything that you think I might have missed. Although I'm pretty certain I remember what I ran a virtual machine and what I ran on my main system. But hey, it is what it is. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. Have a good rest of your day. I will see you most likely tomorrow during a gaming stream. Have a good one.